people join us as soon as the uh, we're out of coffee. Um, uh, it's my pleasure to produce or to introduce uh, Omar Garcia Boulevard. We just met today, although we've been corresponding a little bit uh, by email. Uh, Mr. Garcia Boulevard is the president of BG Consulting here in DC. He specializes in law and development cons consultancy. He has advised countries in Latin America, Africa, and Asia in legal reforms pertaining to business. He's also advised multilateral organizations, including the World Bank and the UN, and governmental organizations, including USAID, on business legal reform matters. Uh, he's written extensively uh, in various continents of business and legal reform, and don't trip on that court. All right. Um, he asked me to abbreviate his uh, introduction, and I will comply so that you'll have more time to hear from him. Uh, but he was listed in the 2005 edition of, the, of Marquis Who's Who in American Law, so you want to look that up. Uh, let's have a round of applause for Mr. Uh, Garcia Boulevard. Good morning. Uh, thank you very much for, for the introduction, Matt. Uh, thank you very much to the organizers for the invitation. All right, uh, I'll do that. Um, so my presentation today is going to be about the role of international legal systems in promoting opportunity, inclusion, and equity with a specific reference to Latin America and Africa. I'm going to start my presentation by, by uh, making reference to an imaginary tale of two people in different parts of the world. Uh, I'm going to talk about Joe and I'm going to talk about Kinter. Joe and Kinter are people in similar conditions but living in different parts of the world. Both are poor people, both are very entrepreneurial, both are young, full of ideas and excited about the possibilities of making their specific businesses grow. Both are street vendors. Let's talk about Joe first. Joe is in the business of selling sandwiches. He lives in a developed country. Joe has a lot of ideas about how to make his business grow. He has realized that a lot of his customers are fond of the sandwiches that he's selling. So out of ideas and time and excitement, he makes an approach to a bank asking for a loan in order to make his business grow. He goes to a bank, he introduces himself, he introduces the business, and he tells the bank that he can give his business as a guarantee in order to get a loan. The bank knows that if Joe doesn't comply with the terms of the loan agreement, eventually they can go to court, they can obtain a quick, efficient, and independent solution to the matter, and they also know that if Joe doesn't satisfy the terms of the agreement, if he defaults on the loan agreement, eventually they can take over his business. So they give Joe a loan, Joe goes very happy back to his business, he makes his business grow, he starts opening stores in different parts of the country, the customers keep coming and coming, eventually he attracts the interest of investors, the investors come, they make the business grow, exponentially. Eventually, he franchises the business, the business goes international, and Joe becomes a very wealthy person. So that's the story of Joe. Quinte, on the other hand, he's very similar. He's poor, he doesn't own any asset similar to Joe. Joe didn't own any asset apart from his business. Quinte is also in the business of selling food in the street. He sells tacos, he sells uh, samosas, he sells kebabs on the street. He's young, he's poor, he doesn't own anything apart from his business. He lives in a piece of land, but he doesn't own an apartment, a house, or any land, and he doesn't know anyone who does. Quinta is also full of ideas. He's poor, but he knows that the business can grow, customers keep coming to his uh, place in the street. So he makes an approach to a bank. He goes to a bank, he introduces himself, he introduces the business, he explains his ideas in order to make the business grow, and he tells the bank that he can give the business as a guarantee. The reply of the bank is that 
the only guarantee that they can accept is a mortgage. And they ask Quinte if he owns any piece of land, or if he owns his house, or if he owns an apartment. He says no, that he doesn't own anything apart from the business, that he doesn't know anyone who owns any land, house, or apartment. Quinte tells the bank that in spite of the fact that he doesn't own anything but the business, he is a very trustful person that if he doesn't comply with the terms of the agreement, eventually the bank can sue him and they can get a solution and you know he would pay whatever he, he needs to pay. The bank knows that that's not gonna happen, that if they go to court, it's, it's gonna take a lot of time, that the solution can be unpredictable and that eventually the courts might not be independent. So as a result of that, Quinte goes back to his house, depressed, without any possibility to make his business grow. He keeps selling food in the street. That provides him and his family a means for survival. Eventually he gets old and sick and he transferred the business to his offsprings and, and the offsprings face the same issues and the offsprings eventually transfer the business to Quinte's grandchildren and it goes on and on. So as you can see, we have two similar people in two different places having different destinies. So what this story tells us is that the legal environment matters. Legal environment matters because at the end of the day, these people are poor or are rich because rights are eventually recognized and opportunities are open for them through legal mechanism. So what we can conclude at this point is that poverty to a large extent, is not a deprivation of income, but mainly a deprivation of rights and a deprivation of opportunities. When people lack rights, certain things, when people lack opportunities that are eventually hindered by the legal system, people have no choice but to be poor. In Latin America and Africa, people know about this. In Latin America and Africa, to a large extent, people are poor because they run out of choices. In Latin America and Africa, you have a land of vast natural resources. Not only commodities, for example oil, not only minerals, not only food, but also people with a lot of ideas, people with an entrepreneurial spirit. In Latin America, for example, we can make reference to Mexico. Mexico probably, you know, <coughs> through reading the recent Forbes list of uh, the wealthiest people in the world, is home to the wealthiest person on the planet, Mr. Carlos Slim. Yet Mexico is one of the countries in the world where the inequality, meaning the gap between the wealthy and the poor people, is among the largest in the world. Mexico is probably in the top 10 of the countries where the so-called Guinea Index uh, exceeds the, the, the threshold of 50%. As you, can, as you know, that Guinea Index shows, if it goes to zero, that means that it's very equal, and if it goes to 100%, it means it's, it's very unequal. Uh, so far, the highest score has been 57%. And Mexico is almost in the, in the threshold of 50%. So what we can see in that example is that in Latin America and Africa, we have a lot of wealthy people, and we, sorry, we have few wealthy people, and we have a lot of poor people and, and a huge gap in the middle. We have resources, but we have to a large extent obstacles that eventually hinder the possibility of people growing, and eventually people making use of their capabilities to take advantage of the opportunities that the system can present. But when there are no opportunities or, or when the capabilities are eventually uh, null, then people have no choice but to survive out of the means that uh, the system can provide. We also have in, in Latin America and Africa the so-called debt capital as many economists have referred to. Debt capital 
referred in the context of 